Hi, good morning. Uh, it's nice to see you all here. So what I want to talk about is um, what may seem like a rather boring topic, institutions, um, but why we not only continue to need them, but also why I believe that uh, each of us, with our sort of new values, should be actively contributing to creating the institutions of the future. So if you look at uh, human history all the way through, we organize ourselves in different ways, tribes, religions, guilds, states, and more recently, companies and networks. And what these institutions do is they sort of codify values and beliefs, and they, they transport them across the generations. So we see this phenomenon that uh, when you codify values in institutions, you give those values longevity. Uh, so this picture is uh, a professional guild of glazers, people that work with glass. And for hundreds of years, they've been sort of conservatively managing their own professional values about how you work with glass, and they share that with people that come after them. It's the same with accountants and lawyers. You know, today there's a lot of pressure on professionals to sort of cut corners, to hide cheating in companies, you know, to sign off accounts which are actually quite dodgy. But these people have professional values and standards built into their institutions that actually are supposed to prevent them uh, from doing that. Now, sometimes, uh, you know, institutions can actually play a really important role in protecting values during hard times. So this is a, an article from a former uh, uh, head of the BBC, and what he points out is that today, when the BBC is really under attack uh, by a conservative government and by commercial interests, nobody really wants in the commercial world to see the BBC being strong, and if it was destroyed, it would never be invented again. And yet, the BBC is probably the greatest custodian of the liberal, sort of multi-ethnic, modern values of the UK, much more so than even the state. So you have a great example of a, a very old, very conservative, quite bureaucratic and old-fashioned institution that somehow manages to protect a notion of public interest and public service broadcasting that the commercial sector and even the government really uh, would never create today. Now, it's interesting, you know, we can be very critical of companies, we can look at them and think they're all sort of bad, but if you look at some of the oldest companies, and there are companies in existence today that go back to the sort of 7th century and the 6th century, you know, there are some very, very old organizations. But what the oldest ones have in common is that they have nurtured their ecosystem. So this is Lloyd's of London, uh, formed in 1688 in a coffee shop through a network of people that wanted to improve uh, shipping. And one of the really interesting things about its history is that in the 1906 San Francisco earthquake, it faced ridiculous levels of claims. And actually, if it did things by the book, it was able to not pay out on lots of those claims. But they said, do you know what? Screw it. Pay everybody. And it cost them the equivalent of like a billion dollars today. But what it did was it built trust and it protected the ecosystem around Lloyds of London that would otherwise have collapsed in the face of those claims. And so it continues today as a successful institution. But the problem is that um, in the 20th century, we built these sort of castles, these corporate castles with thick walls, barriers to entry, you know, preventing other people from competing with them through their sheer size and scale. And then what we did within, uh, within those organizations is we built sort of rigid uh, management structures, rigid bureaucratic hierarchies. Um, and so they, these companies then sort of optimized in these vertical silos to deliver something that wouldn't change. And as a result, by the end of the 20th century, many of them are really struggling um, because things are changing and things are changing a lot more fast, a lot more quickly than they're, uh, they're able to cope with. So I think an interesting question is if bureaucracy was the platform for the sort of Protestant work ethic period of bureaucratic management, then what is the platform for the future? And this is where I think you guys have a really important role to play. So first question, why do we even need institutions? Surely we're all hipsters now in coffee shops with our startups and our, our devices and our sort of craft coffees. Well, I think we do. Um, and I think the first reason why we need them is that actually the world of startups is not as rosy as it might seem. Um, you know, we're building startups whose goal is to die. Yeah? They want to flip, they want to be destroyed by bigger corporate interests or by investors. And effectively, these startups are, are, are sort of a, a, a financial product. They're being traded, bought and sold. This is a flyer that was put up around uh, Palo Alto 
uh, aimed at Palantir workers. Palantir is a massive, absolute mega uh, sort of uh, modern corporation that's developing there. They rent half the city's uh, office space, I think. And people are saying, look, you guys have been fooled. Um, actually, your common stock is worthless. All of the value is accruing to the owners of that company, not to you, uh, the workers or those involved. Um, and I think another challenge is that if you look at where we're going now, it's not all about apps. You know, we're not, we can't live by apps alone. We also need hardware. We need physical goods. And so we're seeing a shift from the virtual world to the sort of back to the real physical world. And what that needs is the engineering skills of Finland and Germany and Italy and the sort of European tradition uh, of how to make things really successfully. But connected products need connected organizations. And this is why I think we really are in need of a fairly radical reworking um, of the institutions that we, that we operate in today. Bosch is a superb company. They make billions of sensors. Their sensors are probably all around this room today. They are superb at engineering, but they're so optimized into these individual product lines that they find it challenging to build lateral connections across them, which is what you need for the connected car, the connected factory, um, and the connected home. Now, we do have some emerging corporate institutions of the 21st century, what uh, Bruce Sterling calls the stacks, Amazon, Facebook, Apple, Google, and so on. Um, but these are not uh, the droids that we're looking for. Um, you know, they are successful. They have created, uh, in some cases, very successful ecosystems. But they are really not a model for the 21st century institution. So the question is, what might the characteristics of a 21st century institution be? And I'm just going to really race through a few of these. Obviously, it's networked. Um, networks are the new value chains. They're the new protection, not the sort of castle walls that we looked at before. Um, but I think they're also lateral and layered. Um, you may have seen this guy, Stuart Brand, a uh, really great thinker um, uh, in California. And he talks about the fact that all civilization is, is built of these layers that move at different speeds. So at the bottom of the stack, you know, nature changes very slowly. Our culture and our governance change a little bit more quickly. But if you look at the top of the stack, areas like fashion and technology um, and content and so on, that changes very rapidly. And we need to reflect this in our organizations. You know, just as software used to be very vertically integrated from top to bottom, now software is a collection of microservices and services and data layers and APIs. And they all move and change at different speeds. And that, I think, is a really good architectural model uh, for the organizations that we'd like to see. We need also to be service oriented. You know, if we have loads of teams who are developing different things or people doing different functions, instead of managing them through a sort of bureaucracy, going up and down hierarchies to get things done, we need peer to peer service oriented relationships. So you know that this team makes X and this team makes Y, and they can work it out between themselves. This is a, a drawing by a friend of mine, Dave Gray, whose book, The Connected Company, is a really good study of how this stuff works um, in the real world. We also need to be platform-based. And that doesn't mean you know, Uber and Airbnb necessarily, where all the value is captured um, at the center. Amazon is a brilliant example of a platform business um, that also develops ecosystems based on its own, its own needs. But actually, the, probably the most interesting ones are in China. Uh, so things like Alibaba and this company called Haya. Um, Haya used to be a state enterprise. It produced really poor quality goods. Um, and this, this guy, uh, Zhang Rumin, sort of changed all of that, first of all, by inverting their hierarchy. Um, so he said, OK, if you are more than three steps away from a customer, you're just a uh, sort of support staff. You're like an admin person. And so suddenly, all of the management talent sort of runs to the edges of the organization and works with customers and markets. But his next and more radical transformation was to turn the company itself into a platform. So each individual department of, this, of this, uh, this company is now a micro enterprise, and they work on a common platform that Hire has created. And the next logical step beyond that is obviously that they can open that up uh, to other companies to operate on their platform. So that's a true platform ecosystem play, and I think very interesting one uh, to study. We need distributed organizations, um, you know, small teams, sort of eight to 20 people focused on a single thing joining together in much more sort of imaginative structures rather than just hierarchies. We need them to be self-managed. Uh, you know, we, we used to think that automation and technology would threaten the lowest level jobs. But actually, I think the biggest threat from automation is middle management. 
It's people whose job is to operate the bureaucracy, to move information from one place to another, and to tell people what to do. Well, you know, that's something that computers are actually pretty good at. So I think we will see um, a replacement of lots of management uh, by sort of algorithmic management and real-time data flowing around um, organizations. Um, I don't know if this word exists, um, but I sort of feel it should. Um, we need cyber organizations. We need sort of cyborgs. In other words, a happy relationship between machines and people. Um, you know, we used to think artificial intelligence was all about replacing human intelligence, but now we realize it's about augmenting human intelligence. It's about creating environments where the skills, the values, the sort of instinct of humans can operate uh, more freely. So this is an example of a factory where you have these sort of friendly cobots operating alongside people, not taking away the skilled work, but doing all the basic stuff um, that people don't really want to do. We need a level of sentience in organizations. Uh, you know, because we are connected with our social networks, we have this human sensor network. It's, it's the basis of what could be a sort of democratic system within organizations where people can tell you what needs to happen, they can give you feedback, they can tell you what's broken, what needs fixing, what's not working so well. And we need to use that, and we're not using that today. And I think we also need self-aware organizations. You know, I, before coming on stage, I look at my Apple Watch to see how ridiculously high my heart rate is because I'm nervous, um, and I can actually get my heart rate down by sort of looking at this, uh, this data. We also need quantified organizations. We need to understand what makes up a healthy organization, and we need to grab the data and the feedback um, to monitor that so that organizations can have a degree of self-awareness that can lead them to transform in new and interesting ways. They probably also need to be agile. Um, we used to think that the way you manage an organization is that you predict and then manage. So you sort of predict the future, and then you manage each step towards that future. Well, the future is more or less unknowable at this point. You know, we can't really plan more than two or three years out. So what we need is to sense and respond. We need this sort of sensitivity to changes and an ability to flex and to adapt. Uh, to meet those changes head on and always be changing rather than just have fixed organizations that go through occasional painful uh, top-down reorganizations. And I think finally, um, another characteristic that I think is really important based on the history of companies is we need globalization. We need to be both glo local and global. This is a, a map of uh, sort of companies or engineer, mostly sort of corporations in, in southern Germany. And if you look at a map of towns like Gütersloh, where Bertelsmann and Miele are based, or Stuttgart, where Bosch is based, or Munich, where Siemens is based, you will see that these are physically located companies that actually try and work in a way with local communities because they need a flow of labor, they need ecosystems, they need suppliers, and so on. But if you do the same map for a hedge fund or a sort of purely virtual financial organization, they really have no location. Uh, maybe it's on a yacht, maybe it's offshore somewhere. And so that means that they're much more prone to throw negative externalities um, out there into the community. And I think these don't need to be local physical communities, they can be uh, virtual networked communities as well. But we need to think about the sort of center of gravity of organizations and make them grounded in the people that they, uh, that they work with. So if we look at um, you know, all these wonderful new models that we have to explore, apologize for the fonts, that's totally not my fault. Um, then, you know, if we're going to do this, if we're going to explore these models, then I really do think that we need to be conscious of the sort of operating system of the organizations and institutions that are going to uh, pursue that future for us. We can't just imagine that, you know, this belongs to someone else and we can just work on products or startups or these cool new ideas. We sort of need to get involved in defining the future of institutions because we don't want sort of big, grand museums like this, uh, which are not very human scale and don't change. What we really want is living systems uh, that people can contribute to. And I think those are the kind of institutions that I believe all of you guys with your lovely values can help build. And I would love to see you get involved in. Thank you. <laughs>